Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Baptist Church. We're so glad that you're tuning in. Uh, if you're part of our Calvary family and you've not been able to make it back yet due to health issues, we want to let you know that we're praying for you. And those of you who have not been able to make it back because of sickness and uh, maybe a spouse is sick, and, and we want you to know we are praying for you specifically, and we miss you. And uh, we also want to let you know if you're watching for the first time, you live in the Elk City area, we'd love for you to come by and join us for a service. That would be a great thing for us. We'd love to meet you. And so come by 1018 West B Avenue and join us for a Sunday service starting at 11 o'clock. We'd love to have you. And then also, if you are watching and you are benefiting from this in any way, we are still currently raising the money for our actual uh, media ministry that we're trying to start. This is still uh, just kind of the uh, temporary way we're trying to actually record. And so if you would like to give, if that this is benefiting you in any way, what a blessing that would be to be able to give to something like this so you can be able to watch uh, every week. We'd love to keep this going, but it, it does take money. It does take the work and effort. So we'd love for you to be able to uh, maybe donate to that just to help us out there. Uh, so this morning, go ahead and turn in your Bible to Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20. And uh, we're going to be talking this morning about because of the gospel we serve. Now, it seems like a lot of times we talk about serving and we, we go to the stories about Jesus and there are some great stories about Jesus serving. But today I really want to set a foundation for what it means to be a servant. What is servanthood in the eyes of Jesus? Why are we called to be servants? And so this morning, that's what we're going to talk about. And so from Matthew chapter number 20, starting in verse number uh, 20. We're going to look through just the first uh, 20 through 28, looking at these verses that talk about the idea of servanthood. So he says, Then came to the mother, come to him, the mother of Zebedee, children with her sons, worshiping him and desiring a certain thing of him. And he said unto her, What wilt thou? She saith unto him, Grant these my two sons may set in the one on the right hand, the other on the left hand in thy kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, You know not what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I shall drink of and to be baptized, that which the baptism I am baptized with? They say unto him, We are able. And he saith unto them, You shall drink indeed my cup and be baptized with my baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it shall be given unto them whom is prepared of my father. And when the ten heard it, they were moved with indignation, the two brethren. And Jesus called them unto him and said, You know the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, that they are the greater exercise authority upon them? But it shall not be so among you. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant." Even so, the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus makes it very clear, if you want to be great in this world, be a servant. Servanthood. That's what we're talking about. Jesus modeled it. Very, very great model of Jesus is just the very act of him coming to earth. In Philippians chapter number. 2, verse 5 through 11, it says, Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. It goes on to talk how that he went on to become obedient even to the death of the cross. We would see Jesus even later in his ministry take a a basin, a bowl, and he'd go by his disciples' feet, and he would bow down, and he'd wash their feet. That included the disciples that would cause him the most frustration, like Peter, and he also washed the feet of Judas. You know, those are some amazing things that Jesus did just in his ministry to show an example of servanthood. And that's something that you and I should take into consideration as we think about this, and and there's a quote that I read this week while studying. It said that by Dr. Charles Stanley, if you and I are to make the impact in life upon others that we should, if 
we are to fulfill God's purpose and plan for our life, and if we're to reap the maximum blessings that God has prepared for us, we, too, must develop the spirit of a servant. And our actions must be the actions of a servant, a servant who realizes that Jesus is not only our Savior, but he is the master of our life. An unwillingness or resistance to serve others in his name is an act of rebellion. He's saying as a believer, it is our God-given duty to obey and be willing to be a servant to God and others. And so we, we see this lesson carried out here in Matthew. And really the lesson is, is having to be taught probably kind of like a, if you have a, a Band-Aid on you, just you get, don't slowly rip it off. Jesus just rips it off and says, let's get to the heart of the matter. Here's the issue, guys. So what we have is James and John. James and John has a mother who comes and he says, hey, listen, Jesus, we would love for my sons to be on your right hand and on your left hand in your kingdom. And so they're thinking about positions of power, positions of influence and greatness. And, and a lot of times we, we see this in our own life. People want positions of greatness so they can have uh, influence or have power over somebody, tell someone what to do. But what they don't want to do is to be a servant. So Jesus wants to set things straight. Jesus really wants them to understand that to be a person of greatness does not mean you have to have position. And so he tells them, he says, listen, your mom has come. Are you going to be able to truly do this? Because if you're going to follow after me, it's going to cost you. It's going to cost you everything. You're going to have to serve people. It's going to be hard. It's going to be difficult. And they said, yes, we can. And he says, well, you're going to, whether you like it to or not, you're going to eventually have to go through that. And, but what happened is the other 10 disciples heard about what the mom had asked, and they were filled with anger because they too want a position. And so Jesus says to them, says, listen, guys, you have to understand that Gentiles, those who don't believe in Jesus, the princes, the, the, the people who are over us and Lord over us, they are always fighting for position. They want position as a, as a king, as a leader, as a prince in the, in the Congress. They, they always, the Senate, they always want positions. They're always fighting for it. And who gets the brunt end? Who gets the blunt end of that? It's us. We're the ones who are affected by it. They're always fighting for position. He says that's not the way Christians should be. As a matter of fact, here's what he says. He says the greatest among you should be a servant. He says the greatest among you, let him be a minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. He's saying if you're going to be great, it starts with being nothing. By being a minister, by being a servant to people. And being a servant is not always easy to do. It's not always it's not always even fun to do. But Jesus is saying, listen, there, there's something you have to understand about the Christian life. If you want any greatness, it must start. It must start with servanthood. John chapter 12, Jesus says, if, if you really want to understand what I'm saying, John chapter 12 says this in verse 25, He that loveth me, uh, he that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me, and where I am there shall also my servant be. And if any man serve me, him will my Father honor. Jesus says, if you follow, if you serve me, my Father will honor you. So here's a good definition that we can work with. That biblical servanthood can be defined this way as a loving act performed in the power of the Holy Spirit to meet the temporal and spiritual needs of those around us and leaving the results to God. Now that's hard to do because we want to see that when we serve, we get recognized for what we've done. We also see serving as something that we want to see that it goes exactly the way that we want to. It's it's interesting today that in the world of social media, it always is that if we go out and we serve, we want to take a selfie to show everybody that we were serving. And that one of the acts of being a servant is really being humble. And sometimes I wonder if we're not doing more harm than good in, in the life of a servant if when we try to do something 
but we're just always trying to let everybody know about it. Might need to just step back and say, hey, we would be more like just that un the person in the background just willing to serve and do whatever is necessary. And, and so we want to make sure that we're doing that, making sure that we're living that life that says, hey, I, I want to be a servant to those around me. I'm going to be led by the Holy Spirit, and I'm going to do the work, and I'm going to leave the results up to God. I, I can't control everything. I'm just going to do what I'm called to do and what I can do. And God has to take care of the rest. So but most people are concerned about me, myself, and I. But we now understand that that really robs us of some true joy. And, and I think if we were to really even consider how, how do we become great servants? How do we become biblical servants? And I, I think it starts with love. It starts with love because that's the greatest commandment. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 22, verse 30, 36, he says, What's the greatest commandment? Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. The first and the greatest commandment. The second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang the law and the prophets. If you want to understand true biblical servanthood, it starts with loving God and loving people. It's almost impossible, impossible to love and serve, excuse me, to serve without love. It, one of the things that we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is that Paul goes in how great love is, how love covers a multitude of sins, how love is patient, love is kind, love is all those things. He says this, he goes on and says that at the end of all this, now abideth, in 1 Corinthians 13, 13, now abideth faith, hope, charity. These three, but the greatest of these is charity. The greatest thing that we can do as a Christian is, is love God and love people. And interestingly enough, love is one of the first things mentioned as a fruit of the Spirit. That is something that I think that is an indication that you and I, as servants of God, must not be motivated because we're supposed to obey God, but we have to be motivated, motivated by love for God and love for others. And so that is something that I think that as we push into understanding what it means to be a servant, it starts with understanding we got to love. And then we have to do it with joy. Uh, there was an acrostic that someone told me about one time is that acrostic of joy and, and understanding how to be a servant, serving with joy is that joy is this, Jesus first, others second, you last. Jesus first, others seconds, you are last. Serving people with joy is Jesus first, others second, you last. Hope that you got that acrostic. Here, here's the reality, though. That's exactly what it is. To serve with joy the people that God has put in your life. To not look for position, but to understand that many people in this world seek out power. But as Christians, we're supposed to not seek out power, but an ability to serve others. So, what is, what is servanthood? What is God's design for servanthood? Point number one is this. Servanthood is God's work in every believer. It's God's work in every believer. Uh, all of our actions reflect the fact that Jesus is not only our Savior, but also that he is the master of our lives and that we are to be his servants all throughout the Bible. Old Testament and New Testament, we would see people talk about being the servants of God, that Paul, Timothy, James, Peter, all these would say that I, Timothy, or I, Paul, a servant of God. Now notice this, that he, he talks about this idea of being a servant, even in our scripture that we read. As a matter of fact, the portion of scripture that we read there that talks about being a servant, he says this, he says that that word there is a Greek word that we get our word deacon, which is really the idea of if you want to be great, you have to serve. You have to be a servant, someone who is willing to serve people. Serve God. So Peter, James, Jude all described themselves as servants. And salvation means more than forgiveness and the assurance of heaven. It's a, It signifies that we are now servants of the living God. Think about what it says in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, 
purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Notice what he says there, that you were saved. God purged out all the old works, the things that you did that were focused on yourself, that you may now serve the living God. God changed you. Yes, he changed your destination, but he's also given you a heart to say, I now want to serve God. I want to serve the living God. I used to think that I was God, but now I recognize that I want to serve the living God. So by that, we think about this, that we actually serve him on earth because serving him on earth is only preparing us for what we're going to be doing in heaven. It's a wonderful thing, salvation, about our life in, in heaven. But did you know that the one of the acts of serving God on earth is also the act of practicing what we're going to be doing in heaven? Look, look at Revelation chapter 22, verse 3. It says, that he, how much more shall the, excuse me, verse, uh, I was reading Hebrews again. Revelation, it says, and there shall be no more curse, no more sin in heaven, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it. And his servants shall serve him. Do you recognize that we'll still be serving God even in heaven? So when the body of Christ loves, serves those in and outside the church, God makes and can make a huge impact in and through us that is absolutely contagious and irresistible. You know, one of the things that I I like about going to places like, um, I got some favorite restaurants. I, I, I'll be honest. I, I love Charleston's in Oklahoma City. I like going to uh, even Chick-fil-A. So there's kind of opposite ends of the restaurant. Sit down restaurant fast food. But what I like about their mentality is when they walk in, when you walk in, the thing that they're always focused on is how may I serve you? How may I help you? Is there anything I can do for you? And then Boy, the service that you get is just phenomenal. The friendliness, the smiling, the the the, the attitude. The uh, what I love about Charleston is my glass never makes it to the bottom. Every time I'm there, I'm drinking a sweet tea. It gets about halfway done, and when I'm halfway done, there's already a fresh one waiting on the table. I love that. I love that whenever they bring me my ribs, they bring out a moist, hot towel with a lemon that they've already squeezed on there for me. I know I'm getting a little off track here, but I love that, that, that feeling there because they're there and they're serving me. I love that feeling that they're there to, to help and to always have that attitude. But can I just remind you, that's a restaurant. How much more should Christians display that same attitude just in everyday living? We are to be servants to people because we are saved. We are supposed to be servants of God because we are saved. Point number two is this, is that God wants us to be servants. That servanthood is how God carries his work out through us. How God carries out his work. Now, now notice that while our actions cannot compare to the actions of Christ, Christ said whenever he left this earth that I'm leaving you here because you need to do great things for me. And though we cannot compare to the, the greatness of, uh, of Jesus, he says this, I want you to understand I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. I'm going to do some great things through you. And, and you will be the, the voice, my voice. You'll be the ones who speak for me to do my work on this earth. So we serve him as we serve others. And he is then free to do and will do true greatness through us. That's how we work. God says, I've saved you, but I've saved you for a purpose. I want you to serve me by serving others. And there's a great thing that I want you to do. I want you to serve others, not just to meet people's temporal needs, but people have a spiritual need that they had to have uh, uh, fixed in their life. So I want you to go preach the word in season, out of season. I want you to go and tell others about me. I want you to go on mission. I want you to, every time you leave this door, I want you to go out. And as a matter of fact, Matthew 5, 16 really sums it up. He says, I want you to let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Every time you leave church, every time you go outside, every time you're interacting with your family, in the mindset of a servant, you are doing the work of God. God said that I'm going to use you. Now, why he wants to use us blows my mind. 
Why in the world would God choose to use us when he could have used any other form? And I believe it's this, that we are the greatest testimony of people being changed from the old person to the new person through salvation. And we all should be so overwhelmed by the goodness of God and what he has done for us that we are the greatest testimony and example of Jesus Christ. That we are living examples of what he has done in our own life. I know that back in 1 Samuel, Samuel is talking to the nation of Israel. He says, hey, listen, we serve God because of all the great things he has done for us. And I feel like that should be the reason why we serve God. And we want people to see our good works. Our service is a witnessing tool to those who do not know Jesus. It also could be a challenge to those that do and those that need to improve on their serving as well. But don't ever serve out of a mindset of, hey, look at me. It's all about me. No, 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 no. You serve that maybe people can see your good works, but it's never focused on you. The glory always goes back to God. So we want people to see our good works, but that's how we as servants, it is servanthood carries out God's work. But also this, servanthood, number three, is essential for your spiritual growth. If you are not serving, you are not growing. You say, well, Brad, that's awfully blunt. Well, here's what one person said. If you are not serving God in some fashion, You are simply not maturing spiritually, nor can you mature spiritually in every church and in every Christian organization. There are people who have talents, skills and gifts, but never use them for the work of the Lord. And each one of these are spiritual babes still in Christ. That was pretty blunt. But here's what he says. If you're not serving others or serving God. You're not growing in your spiritual life. Now I wonder if the reason why we have not seen some stay more faithful to God is because they come to church, but they don't serve God. One of the things that I've noticed is the people who really stick with church find areas to serve in. And I'm not trying to cause a guilt or anything like that. But what what I've noticed is people who want to get on a run a church van riot with my wife or somebody who wants to get involved in the nursery, somebody who wants to get involved in uh, just cleaning the church or somebody who wants to get involved in mowing the yard or uh, serving in a Sunday school, uh, uh, just serving in any way possible. What I have found is that the, when people start to serve, they stay dedicated to Christ more often. That is a challenge for us to think about. It's because more than likely when they serve, they recognize that they are growing spiritually. Jesus is doing something in them, and they're growing during that time of service. Just challenge to you, if you're not serving, you're probably not growing. And you say, well, I I don't know if I believe that. Well, we'll think about what it says in Ephesians 2.10. It says this, that for we are his workmanship. We are part of his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. He says, You are created for good works. You're created to serve. You're created by God to be more than just focused on yourself. We are not saved merely, not saved merely to be freed from the guilt of sin, but that, so that we will serve the Lord and others. And we should humbly seek to serve people with the attitude Christ had, even when our giving is overlooked, maybe whenever it's taken for granted by everyone. Recognize our Heavenly Father, He notices. Notice what it says in Hebrews 6.10, For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which you have showed toward His name, that in that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. Listen. Jesus wants you to serve, and he wants you to recognize this as part of your spiritual growth, and he notices. He takes note of your service. The last thing is this, and we'll be getting close to closing now, is that servanthood is the purpose for your spiritual gifts. God has blessed each of us with spiritual gifts, and he wants us to use each of those gifts to serve others. Servanthood is love in action, 
and we each have different spiritual gifts and we are to use that gift to serve others. God may have gifted you with something that, that nobody else here at the church has. Maybe he's gifted you with the gift of mercy. You're, you're very understanding and you're uh, merciful to people. The gift of preaching, the gift of serving, singing. You're, maybe just the gift of uh, lifting people up. God has gifted you with something. And God wants you to use those gifts to serve him by serving people. Here at the church, outside the church, Romans chapter 12 actually has uh, is a good chapter. It talks about how we should present our bodies, living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is a reasonable service that we can perform to the world. But then he goes on to say there in chapter, verse number three, For I say to the grace given unto me that every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. For as we are members, uh, many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we bring many, our one body in Christ, and every one members one to another, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy let us prophesy according to the proportion of our faith, our ministry, let us wait our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching. Or he that exhorteth on exa- exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence, let him show mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectionate one to another with brother- brotherly love and honor, preferring one another. He's saying this, that God has given each of us a gift to practice within the church, practice within the community, in the spirit of love. And what God's gift that he's given to you you're supposed to use. So I, I am often reminded, though, that First Peter chapter four verse ten also says this: that as every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Now think about this: the gifts that God has given to you is because of the grace of God, God's grace, His unmerited favor that He's given you the talent that you have. That's God. Not you. And think about this. He says this. He says, I want you to make sure that you use it for me. I want you to make sure that understand that I gave it to you so that you serve others uh, by serving me. Or you serve me by serving others with that spiritual gift. Don't, don't, don't keep it to yourself. Use that gift. Sometimes I, I wonder if that whole comment of, use it or lose it is actually true here too if you fail to use your spiritual gifts you might lose those spiritual gifts i want you to stay focused on this that god has saved you to serve god is understandably giving us the the desire to serve and whenever whenever that happens understand this that he says that i i'm using you to carry out my work and as part of your spiritual growth but lastly this it says that it's the purpose of your spiritual gifts that god's given you spiritual gifts to be carried out to serve other people. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 14 through 16 says this, that you are the light of the world. A city that sit on the hill cannot be hidden. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Your works are to be used that people can be impacted. You're the light of the world. Serve people. So, servanthood is God's work in every believer. It's how he carries out his work. It's essential for your spiritual growth, and it's the purpose for our spiritual gifts. One of the uh, best books that I've read uh, a long time about spiritual growth by Oswald Chambers is My Utmost for My Utmost for My Highest. My phrase highest. And he says this as we finish off this message. It says, The institutional church's idea of being a servant of God is not like Jesus Christ's idea. His idea is that we serve him by serving others. He said that in his kingdom, the greatest ones would be the servant of all. The real test of a saint is not one's willingness to preach the gospel, but one's willingness to do something like washing the disciples' feet. That is being willing to do those things 
that seem unimportant in human estimation, but count as everything to God. It was Paul's delight to spend his life for God's interest in other people. And he did not care what it cost. But before we will serve, we stop to ponder our personal financial concerns. What if God wants me to go over there? And, and if he does want me to go over there, what about my salary? What about the climate that's there? What if, who is going to take care of me? All these are indications that we have reservations about serving God. Jesus Christ's idea of a New Testament saint is this, not one who merely proclaims the gospel, but one who becomes broken bread and poured out wine in the hands of Jesus Christ for the sake of others. God promises that he will honor service and humility. Remember that Jesus said in John 12, 26, if any man serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. And if any man serve me, him will my father honor. It's a wonderful thought. God wants us to be broken and spilled out for him. He wants us to be used up. Don't keep it all for yourself. Use your gifts. Use your talents. Use it to serve people and serve God. So what is biblical servanthood all about? This last thing and I'll read will be done. It's an act of loving service performed in the power of the Holy Spirit to meet people's spiritual and temporal needs, those people who are around us, not looking for recognition, but leaving the results to God. And when we as followers of Jesus finally realize our calling is to serve, not merely to seek our own interest, then we will have an irresistible impact on are you a servant today? The greatest servant of all left his throne in glory to come to this earth to die for you. Maybe this morning it's hard to be a servant because God's not changed your heart to think that way. Maybe you don't know Christ as your personal Savior. Jesus humbled himself and became a servant to go and die on the cross for you. As a matter of fact, Look at what verse number 28 says of Matthew chapter 20. Even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus came to die for you. If you do not know Jesus Christ is your personal Savior today, he wants you to know you can be saved, that you have a sin debt because it's just human nature. That sin separates you from God. And he came to make peace between you and God by dying on the cross for our sins. All you have to do is put your faith in the gospel to believe that gospel message that he, he came, he died, he was buried, and he rose on the third day and he's alive today. And that he sets up on the right hand of God. And that you must confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says in Romans, and thou shalt be saved. Ask him to forgive you your sins today. If you do not know Jesus Christ as your Savior, that is the best decision you can make today. If you are saved, are you serving? There is no such thing as someone who is saved who is not supposed to be a servant. Jesus has called, God has called us to obey in a loving and willing, joyful spirit to serve other people. He chose us to serve. He can use any other way, but he chose you and he chose me. Are we being the servants that God has called us to be today? Let's have a word of prayer and we'll close this message. Lord, thank you for the day that you've given to us. Lord, help us all to be servants of you, to serve you by serving others. God, let us stay focused on other people more than we do ourselves. Lord, help us not look for advancement to be recognized, Lord, but to simply just be the, the person who's willing to serve, regardless if we're recognized or not. Jesus, thank you so much for sending your son to the, our God, thank you so much for sending Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. And Lord, we are so thank you, thankful that we can be saved and eternity in heaven. And help us stay focused on your mission, which is to see other people come to know you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hope you have a great rest of your Sunday. Lord bless you. And I hope that maybe sometime soon we'll be able to see you here back in church. God bless.